Welcome to this online lesson on the transport revolution. Our aim is to gain knowledge about the transport revolution by studying roads, canals and railways. Here's a do now task. Describe what you see in this picture and why might it be happening. Pause the video while you have a go at that and then I'll give you some hints as to what is really going on here and what link that has to the rest of our lesson. Well, let's see what's going on. There appears to be some sort of fence or gate that's being broken, surrounded by angry people. They're wearing women's clothes, but that doesn't actually mean they are women. What is actually going on here is a protest. That gate is a toll gate. It's a sort of gate that would only be open for you if you paid a charge to use the road beyond it. This was a common thing in the Industrial Revolution as the Turnpike Road system opened up the United Kingdom. Turnpike roads charged a toll for their use, but they were of much higher quality than other roads in the area. The trouble was, in, in regions where people relied on transport and had previously transported their goods for free along the roads, they couldn't sometimes uh, afford to pay these different tolls without going out of business, and therefore they protested them. In one particular instance in Wales, there was the outbreak of something called the Rebecca Riots. This is where men decided to wear their, their wives' clothes as a disguise and then vandalise and smash up the toll gates of these roads as a protest. And they became known as the Rebecca Rioters because they would send a warning letter ahead which was signed from the Daughters of Rebecca. So it's a piece of traditional Welsh protest where Welshmen would dress up in women's clothes as a disguise. But I bet it put you off the scent, didn't it? This lesson will have a significant local focus. This is the town of Great Torrington, happens to be where I live and where I teach. Even if you're not watching this within Torrington itself or the local area, it's quite handy because lo and behold, this small rural town in North Devon actually gives us a pretty representative view of the different types of transport revolution that took place during the Industrial Revolution. I'm going to indicate some of them now on this aerial photograph. First of all, a canal was built to transport limestone to a sea lock at a place called Land Cross. This canal was quite small in scale and the canal barges were propelled by horses. Within just a few years though, this canal went virtually out of use, but actually in stages. But before it did, it had some quite impressive engineering. For one thing, it's not just a case of digging a big trench and filling it with water. You needed to keep that waterproof. There needed to be various sluice gates along the way to keep it both supplied with water and stop it overflowing. And at one point there was what was called an inclined plane. This is where a water wheel would power a winch to drag loaded canal boats up a ramp in order to change the level of the canal. This was very high technology at the time and is quite unusual on, on the canals. However, the canal did not last for that long. Part of the canal was filled in and turned into a turnpike road. This is now known as Roll Road and can still be walked to this day. It bypasses the town of Great Torrington, which includes a substantial climb in either direction up a great big hill. And so this was a sensible option in order to uh, save the horses with the extra exertion of having to drag their, uh, their supplies up the hill unnecessarily. However, this was not done for free. There were toll gates at either end, and the turnpike roads were later improved and extended all the way to Biddeford. I've in indicated the location of three of the toll houses along the route. So what could be the third example? Well, although it's not there anymore, by the 1870s, Torrington had got a railway station. And by the early 20th century, this had been extended to a place called Howell Junction and the other end too. But before that, there was a terminus railway station from 1872 where the trains would stop at the end of their journeys. Again, this was at the bottom of the hill and was partly built along the old canal route. So we can see how the old technology of the canals was superseded by improved roads and then eventually by the railways. All that's left now, though, is the road. Royal Road at the bottom of the hill is no longer in use. The Biddeford Road is very much still in use and the railway disappeared, well, for passengers in the late 60s, but the rails were finally taken up in the 1980s. So even in this small North Devon town, we get a sense for how transport changed during the Industrial Revolution. Let's have a look at some photographs that help demonstrate this. Firstly, this is a view of Roll Road at the bottom of Torrington Commons. Notice that there appears to be two paths, a wide one and a narrow one. 
The narrow path is actually slightly raised up. This was known as the tow path, where the horses would walk along, dragging a rope behind them that would pull the barges along the canal. The canal itself was filled in on the right. It still gets flooded even now because the drainage is very poor here, as it appears that they didn't do an awful lot to uh, get rid of the waterproofing underneath it. They simply filled it with rubble, levelled it off and turned it into a road. Although admittedly, the road would have been higher quality 150 years ago when it was in full use. Here's another better preserved section of the Roll Canal. Nope, I don't know who that woman is either, but this was just a photograph I found online. Notice the strange shape of the bridge. It's got a sort of curved arch to the side of it. This would provide a little bit more room for the horses that were walking along the towpath that the woman is standing on. This is towards the end, uh, halfway point on the uh, canal where there would be the opportunity for horses to be changed so that uh, they didn't get too exhausted on the journey. And this is a diagram of the winching engine. This is one that was uh, built on the Bude Canal in North Cornwall, but the same engineer built the one on the Roll Canal too. As you can see, the loaded canal uh, barges are pulled up the hill by the winches and a water wheel, with empty uh, canal barges going down, acting as a sort of counterweight. It's complicated, but very high technology for the time. So let's consider first of all the canals. Add this as a subheading to your notes. What might be the advantages of roads over canals? But what might be the advantages of canals over roads? Pause the video now and consider those questions. Write down your answers. Well, one advantage of roads over canals is that they tended to be a lot faster. The horses could pull a coach very much quicker than they could pull a canal barge. However, they couldn't carry very big weights on their coaches, and so if it was a, a case of uh, pulling along delicate or very bulky and heavy items like coal, it would be difficult to, use, to transport them quickly by road. On the other hand, the canals provided very smooth passage, so if you were uh, transporting pottery from, say, uh, the Wedgwood potteries in the Midlands, then a canal would be a good way of doing it without smashing up all the lovely new pots. Alternatively, another uh, advantage of the canals was the fact that one large horse, like the one shown here, could pull a very heavy load of coal or other materials on a single um, barge. This made them incredibly efficient, but they were very, very slow. We're going to start off with an accomplishment task. We're going to work out how canals were built and how they worked. Heavy loads could be carried relatively easily on barges. Barges were long narrow boats that were, still, were well suited to the calm waters of canals. In fact, sometimes they're even called narrow boats. Delicate loads could be transported smoothly and safely. And early barges did not have engines, so they were pulled by horses from the bank. By using special locks, they could even climb slopes, but more on that later. For the time being, have a go at producing your own drawing or diagram like the one on the screen here. Pause the video while you do this, and this will provide you with a useful diagram showing how canals worked. Pause the video now. Hopefully you've got your drawing done now, and I hope that you can recognise the raised towpath, and that's in comparison to the navigable channel. This was the bit that the boats could get down. This is very similar to what we saw earlier with the Roll Canal near Torrington. But how did they get them up hills? Well, let's consider this. A canal engineer would have three main options for dealing with a hill. They could go under it with a tunnel. They could go over it with either an inclined plane or a lock, or they could simply try to avoid it altogether, even if this made the journey and the route a lot longer. Although that would be avoided where possible, because a longer canal costs a lot more money to build. One of the biggest challenges for a canal builders was going up hills. Water won't flow uphill, so four main methods were developed to solve this problem. So first of all, you could go around. If the hill isn't, bi isn't big, it may be easiest to detour right around it. Similarly, if it's absolutely enormous, you might have to detour around it because you wouldn't be able to use any of the other methods. Secondly, there's tunnelling. A really big hill may need to be tunnelled under, but the tunnel can't be too long. At this time, it would be difficult to get the horse to drag your uh, canal uh, barge all the way through the tunnel. So instead, the, uh, the barge owners would have to get onto their backs and put their feet on the ceiling of the tunnel and literally walk the canal through, or walk the barge through rather. This was known as legging it. Thirdly, the inclined plane. 
This works like a lift for the barges, but it needs a big water wheel and can only be used with small barges. It does work on very steep hills though. You can see in the picture there's an example of one here, but this is powered by a steam engine, hence the chimneys, rather than the water wheel. Lastly, there's the most common variety, the lock. These can be used to raise the water level stage by stage. It's a slow process, but it is a, re a reliable way of doing it if there is a long and gradual climb. Your task then. Which method would work best in these following situations? Explain your choice. A very steep hill, but not a very high hill. There is a stream running down it. B. A very big wide row of hills made from soft stone. C. A long and gradual climb over some moorland rising from the coast and going inland. And D. A small hill that isn't very wide in otherwise flat land. Pause the video and match the solution to the problem and explain why you've made that choice. Pause the video while you complete that. Let's consider option A. A very steep hill but not a very high hill with a stream running down it. Well the stream would be ideal for either supplying a steam engine or powering a water wheel. And if it's very steep you could use an inclined plane. B. A very big wide uh, row of hills made from soft stone. Well if it's made from soft stone it should be reasonably easy to tunnel through. So if it's impossible to get around it and impractical to go over it, tunnel through it. The long gradual climb over some moorland would be ideal for some locks. You wouldn't need to build them in too many um, uh, intervals and instead you could just make gradual progress going up. And the small hill with plenty of flat round around, land around it, well instead of going direct just go around it would be the easiest option. We're now going to have a look at how a canal lock works. I've included a link to a video in the description to this particular video that shows how this works in a real life situation. The so-called Black Country, which was named after all the soot that would end up over the buildings, which is in the Midlands outside Birmingham, was a real centre of canal operations. In fact, many of the industries there relied on the canals for transport. This video has been put together by a group of children from a place called Dudley, and so you'll recognise their regional accents as being very much from the Midlands of the UK. So I hope you enjoy that, and I can assure you the accents are better than mine. Once you've done that though, you can draw a basic diagram like this one. But be on the lookout for some of the terminology. You have gates at both the top and bottom of the lock. You have what's called the lock chamber, where the ship or boat can go up and down. You have sluice gates or paddles, which let the water travel from the chamber and to the different parts of the canal. So, the first part of the operation is that the bottom gates are opened and when the water is level, the barge enters the lock chamber. The bottom gates are then closed again. Water is let into the top gate using the sluice gate. The water rises and with it the barge. Once the water reaches the same level as the upper canal, the gate can be opened and the barge can sail on. And if you wanted to go downhill, it's the same process, just in reverse. So once you watch the video, create your own version of this diagram and that will conclude our study of canals. Pause the video while you complete that. OK, let's move on to part two. Let's have a look at a part of a source. In this, famous writer Daniel Defoe describes a road. This is from his book A Tour Through the Whole Island of Great Britain, which was a travel memoir written in 1724, at a time when very few people would have travelled around the whole of the country. In this, he describes a road of that time. I left Tunbridge and came to Lewis through the deepest, dirtiest roads in all that part of England. Sometimes a whole summer is not dry enough to make the roads passable. Here I saw a lady drawn to church in her coach by six oxen, the road being so deep and stiff that no horses could go in it. Indeed, during the winter or rainy months in England, many of the very bad roads in the, in the country would simply fall apart and you literally couldn't get down them. This is partly because nobody was prepared to pay lots of money to improve them or maintain them. Indeed, it's arguable that very few well-engineered roads have been built in Britain since the Romans had left and so many Roman roads in some form or other were still being used at this time and indeed we still use them to this day. But clearly something needed to be done. Roads were and are a crucial part of the transport network. So fixing the roads would help transport overall. Enter the Turnpike Roads. 
Compare this photograph of a turnpike road in about 1880 with Defoe's description. What are the main differences? So read Defoe's description again, then have a look at the photograph and say why this particular type of road is better. Pause the video while you do this. Okay, one of the things that should be immediately apparent is this road has got a proper gravel surface, unlike the muddy one that Defoe is describing. Another thing you'll notice is it's got a gate across it. Yes, this gate would deliberately get in your way, but it would be opened once you'd paid a toll, presumably to the people who are standing outside the house. Indeed, when you drive on modern roads today, you sometimes see little houses by the side of the road, and these were where the gates were originally, and that's why they are known as toll houses. In uh, the region which I live, there are three surrounding the town of Torrington, but more further afield as well. And that was the thing. The tolls that you had to pay to use these would go to the upkeep of the roads and also get a little bit of profit for the companies that built them. But I hope you can appreciate these roads are far higher quality than the ones that, the, that existed in the 1720s. Let's look at how turnpike roads operated. Turnpike roads were built in the late 1700s and early 1800s to improve the quality of roads across Britain. They were very expensive to build, so expensive that the British government couldn't actually afford to pay for them. They were engaged in the Napoleonic Wars at this time, and so didn't have the spare money to spend on things like roads. Instead, private companies could apply to Parliament to get a licence to build a road. These companies were called turnpike trusts. A turnpike was originally a sort of frame that could be used as a road barrier, and so they were a way of stopping horses going down a road. In effect, this reflects the practice of putting gates across the roads to prevent people going down them without paying. They would charge people a toll, or a fee, to use the road, and this would pay for the building costs with a bit of profit for the investors on top. So, some quick questions then. Firstly, explain what a turnpike trust was, in your own words. And secondly, why did the road builders charge a toll to use the roads? Finally, you can see a picture at the top that shows the construction of these roads. Notice that they're made of levels of stone of differing sizes, and the gravel on top is being packed flat. This is the time before tarmac. It's what's known as a macadamised road. In other words, it was invented by a guy called Macadam. What's interesting about that is when tar was accidentally tipped on a macadamised road, it produced tarmac, which is far more hard-wearing, and it's how roads are made, made today. And where did they get all the little chippings from? Well, some of it was made by prisoners breaking stones. Think of that. Anyway, I'm digressing now. Have a go at those questions and pause the video while you do it. So, all good. Everyone's happy, right? Well, not quite. Let's get some indications as to why. This is a real turnpike sign, probably dating to around about the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. This is on the road between Great Torrington and Exeter in Devon, at a place called Tor Bridge. These days it's a private house, so I don't recommend that you go hanging around there if you're passing by, but if you are travelling between Torrington and Exeter, you might well see this particular house and sign. It's a very distinctive, tiny little uh, bungalow just across the bridge. What's interesting about it though is it gives us an indication. So I've zoomed in on a part of the sign here, which tells us how many pence you would have to pay in order to cross with various types of load. Now bear in mind, if it was your job to transport these materials, you might have to pay these costs more than once a day in order to use the road, and so the costs would go up quite substantially. And although sixpence doesn't sound like a lot today, that might be five or ten pounds in, that, in the money of today, which would soon add up across the course of a week, wouldn't it? So let's have a read of the sign. It is a bit unclear, so I'll give you a hand with it. List of tolls to be taken at the several toll gates and bars on the Great Torrington Turnpike Roads. Okay, bear that in mind. This is just one toll gate on one section of road. And if you had a fair distance to go, you might go through three or four of these having to pay each time. For every horse or other beast, except an ass, uh, which means donkey before I get complaints, uh, drawing any carriage or other vehicle of any kind, sixpence. For every extra carriage or other vehicle affixed to the carriage or vehicle drawn by the said horse or other beast, another sixpence. Um, in other words, what they're talking about there is a trailer. 
For every carriage or vehicle drawn or propelled by steam machinery or other power except animal or manual uh, power for each wheel of such carriage, sixpence. For each wheel of, some, of, of such carriage. Well, what does that mean? If you've got a great big traction engine, that's sixpence a wheel. So that's 24 pence in total. Well, why would they charge more for that? Well, being heavier, it would have a greater wearing effect on the road, wouldn't it? For every horse drawing lime, sea sand or salt to be used for manure, guano, that's bird droppings, or any artificial manure, tuppence. For every ass drawing any carriage or vehicle, threepence, or threepence. For every horse or other beast drawing any carriage where laden with timber, sixpence. So yeah, a little bit more expensive there because timber would be so heavy it would damage the road more and the upkeep would be greater. So you get a sense that actually this would add up over time. If every time you use a section of road you had to pay a few pence, it would really be a big cost. Now many people saw this as worth it for a quality road. Others did not. We're now going to categorise the effects of the turnpike roads. Create a table. Give one side the heading changes for the better, so these were the good benefits that the turnpike roads brought, and the other unpopular effects. Uh, these might be intended or unintended effects of the turnpikes that people didn't like. Write out the following factors under the appropriate headings. I'll read them all to you and you can pause us at any time and continue when you're ready. By 1830 there were over 30,000 miles of high quality roads in Britain built by the turnpike trusts. To put that in perspective that would go more than once around the world. Turnpike roads made it easier to travel and transport goods. There were some riots over the tolls that turnpikes charged, a bit like the Rebecca riots we saw right at the start of the lesson. Parliament did very little to control how much the turnpikes charged people to use them. In other words, Parliament didn't intervene if people were charging too much. Some turnpike trusts charged unreasonably high tolls. Turnpike roads were built without costing the government much money. Some people found that they suddenly had to pay to use the roads that they had, had been able to use for free beforehand. Journey times were shorter on the smooth and well-made turnpike roads. They were safer too. People became more likely to travel as it became easier to do so. Many people were able to sell goods to places further away because of the new roads. And some turnpike roads were very poorly maintained but they still charge the tolls. Okay, so categorise those effects under changes for the both better and unpopular effects. Pause the video while you do that. Hopefully you can appreciate then that the turnpikes were a good thing, but they did have some undesirable effects. We don't tend to have many toll roads in this country today, so instead, how on earth do they pay for all these roads that we use? Well, the answer is, well, there's various answers to that, but probably the biggest one is car tax. You need to pay tax on your car in order to access public roads, and so that helps pay for their upkeep. So were the turnpike roads a good thing overall? Simply answer this question. I've included this writing frame to help you. And it shouldn't take you much longer than about 10 minutes. So now it's all up there. You can pause the video and have a go. And remember, there is no wrong answer to this. If you think they're a good thing, say so. If you think they're a bad thing, say so. But make sure you back it up and explain it using this writing frame if you need to. Pause the video now. So we've looked at canals, we've looked at roads. What's next? Railways. This is your next subheading. In 1750, railways basically didn't exist. By 1800, there were a few horse-drawn tramways that existed, but not proper railways. Here's an example of a horse-drawn tramway, and this horse is shown posing in an empty wagon, presumably getting a lift downhill. Yes, they really did give the horses a lift on the downhill sections. But by 1900, just 100 years later, there were 22,000 miles of railways. That's far more than we even have in the country now. 
Look at the state of that map. It is absolutely crisscrossed with railway lines. You can even probably see one go into your hometown. Notice that many of the railways radiate out from the great industrial cities, Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham, and in particular in the southeast, London. But there are far fewer railways than this today, partly because the roads have improved. After 1963 and the Beeching Acts, you can see that the number of railways has declined substantially. And then by 1984, we're left with virtually the network that we've got today, a shadow of its former self. But in their time, the railways were a huge transport revolution in terms of speed, quantity of goods and passenger traffic. So let's have a look at how they worked. Let's consider a local example. In the picture here, I've got the restaurant and cafe called the Puffing Billy in Great Torrington. This is now part of the Targa Trail cycle route, but originally this was Torrington's railway station. Torrington station closed the passengers in 1965 after what was called the Beeching Axe, and goods trains ended in 1981. But when was it opened? Well, it was opened way back in 1872. So at Torrington Station was an important station in the region, and it handled the following. Passengers, including direct trains to get to London. In other words, you could board your carriage at Torrington and not have to change trains until you got to London itself. It would take about seven hours to get there. Fresh milk for London. Two milk trains would be loaded uh, at Torrington and taken up to Vauxhall in London every single day, seven days a week, virtually 365 days a year. In the photograph at the bottom, you can just see part of the goods shed where the milk was loaded. China clay for the potteries in Barnstable and the Midlands. This would come from a place called Peters Marlin, just up the railway line. So, when closed, which of these purposes do you think would have been most missed by the community of Torrington? And I could have included more. General goods were also taken along, and there was actually quite a strong livestock market as well, with cattle and sheep being loaded here, and there even a coal merchant's. But of those three main purposes, which do you think the local community would have missed the most? Pause the video while you make your choice. Well, the fact is that the china clay and potteries are mostly still in business. The mines where these things are taken out of the ground are still in use and it's now transported by road. Though it has to be said, the large china clay lorries doing this are very polluting. So what about the fresh milk for London? Again, perhaps less necessary now with better milk processing plants. At this time, there was very little refrigeration and so it was necessary to deliver fresh milk every single day before it went off. But consider this, the passengers. Although Torrington Station wasn't all that accessible, I think a lot of people do miss the opportunity to just go down to the train station and get a train directly to London today. Not only that, but you could get to Barnstable, Biddeford, Exeter and various other places too. And perhaps at a time where we're more environmentally conscious and we'd like to get more cars off the road, it's a shame that we don't have the railways anymore. Here's a couple other pictures of Torrington Station just to give you an idea of what a bustling place it was. This is a picture of a tourist train just after it closed the passengers. We can see a milk siding to the right. Here are some of the milk carts being loaded up for London. Two trains every single day of around this size. Here we can see the, the milk being loaded into the tanks. And this is one of the last trains ever to pass through Torrington. In the early 1980s, a tourist train pulled by a diesel crossed the River Torridge. This is the Iron Bridge, which you can now cycle and walk across. So this is all the result of something called the Railway Mania. We're going to finish up by playing something of a game which will help us understand how the railways were funded. In the 1840s, the railways were the next big thing. Thousands of miles of new track were being laid every year, and they were all built by private companies, a little bit like the turnpike roads. They were expensive to build, but many ordinary people gave money to the railway companies if they bought shares. This meant that if, that's right, if the railway made a profit, they would get their money back with a big bonus on top, because they would effectively own a small portion of the business. But only some railways made their money. Others didn't, and this financially ruined the people that had pumped money into them. 
Some time ago, there was a popular quiz show on TV called The Million Pound Drop. In it, contestants were given £1 million in cash and then multiple choice questions. They would have to share out the money depending on how sure they were that that was the answer to the question. So usually they would share the money between two wrong answers and a right one. And if they got the wrong answer, then they would lose the money that had been placed on that. However, if they gambled and put all of their money on the right answer, then they got to keep it all. This is a little bit like the system of buying shares. If you invest all your money in a, a company that is profitable, you get all of your money back with a load of profit on top of it. However, if you gamble it and try and put it on a company that isn't, doesn't turn out to be very profitable, then you can lose everything. We're going to play a bit of a game now which will help us understand that. You're going to become a railway investor. You will see information about five real railways that were founded in the railway mania of the 1840s. But this was a risky business. You will only have enough money to buy 10 shares in total. So keep a note and a tally as you go through of how many shares you're going to invest out of your total of 10 on each company. Remember, you're going to see five. If you buy 10 shares from just one company, you could lose everything. But you might also make a massive profit if you've actually made a good choice. If you spread your shares around to reduce the risk, you might make less money. How much of a risk will you take? And bear in mind, if you put all of your shares on the first one, then you might lose them all. But if you just decide to put a couple on there, but there are no better ones, you could still end up losing out. So this really is a gamble, but that's how investors of the time had to um, do it with real money too. Do you know a good deal when you see one? You'll need to decide how many shares to buy in each company and in your book or on a piece of paper, explain why you have chosen to invest the number that you have, if any. Let's have a look at your first option for investment. How many of your 10 shares would you invest in this company? Company number one, the Great Western Railway. The Great Western Railway was started by legendary engineer Isambard Kingdom Brunel in 1838. There's a picture of him on the screen. The planned line was to run from London uh, to Bristol in the southwest, and later to Wales, Devon and Cornwall too. The line will be served by powerful fast locomotives. The gauge, which is the tr uh, gap between the rails of the track, was planned to be seven foot and a quarter inches, bigger than the standard four foot eight and a half inches of all other railways. This made trains run smoother and have wider, more comfortable carriages. Brunel was determined to use this gauge, even though all other railways settled on four foot eight and a half inches. The railway was planned to link up with Brunel's own steamships crossing to the USA. So the idea was that you could buy a ticket in London and end up all the way in New York by taking Brunel's railway and steamships like the SS Great Britain. So you've got all 10 of your shares to play with for this company. How many of them are you going to invest? If you invest all of them, it means you won't have any shares to use on the next four companies. So that will be a really big risk. If you use too few, on the other hand, you might well um, regret it later on when you hear what the other companies are like. So there is an element of a gamble here. But the reason you're doing this is because that is exactly the gamble that people had to take in the 1840s during the railway mania. Once you've made your mind up, you can complete this little writing frame. I invested how many shares in the GWR? I invested this many because I'm going to explain with reference to the pros and cons of this particular railway. You can do this even if you didn't end up investing any shares whatsoever, because you'll be able to explain why you chose not to invest those shares. Pause the video while you decide how many shares you're going to invest. Okay, have you chosen how many shares you're going to invest? Well, make sure you update your total. So, for example, if you've invested two shares, then you've only got eight to play with for the next four companies. Company number two, the York and North Midland Railway. The York and North Midland Railway was the idea of George Hudson in 1837. That's him in the picture. Hudson was known as the Railway King and had already made a fortune building railways. The line was to be engineered by the famous George Stevenson, whose earlier railways had already proved incredibly successful. Hudson relied on people buying shares in his company to pay for it, and he wanted to keep as much money for himself as possible, even if that meant risking other people's money. But that's the name of the game when you're investing in shares. So how many shares are you going to risk on the York and North Midland Railway? Note down the number of shares invested and the reason why you chose that number. And remember, update how many of your 10 shares you've got left after doing so. Pause the video while you do that.
Company number three. How many shares have you got left? Hopefully you still have some left to invest in this company possibly, or perhaps you want to save it for one of the last two. The London and North Western Railway was created when three earlier companies merged together. These companies had never run at a profit, and it was hoped that by linking them together, more people might be able to use them. The lines were mostly already built, so the challenge is actually to convince people to actually buy tickets and use the railway. The London and North Western Railway linked London to Birmingham and Manchester, both rapidly expanding towns during the Industrial Revolution. So how many of your precious shares are you going to risk on the London and North Western Railway? Decide and then explain why you've chosen that number to invest. Pause the video while you do so. OK, just two companies left now. I hope that you've got some shares left to invest on them. The London and East Anglia Railway. This railway was proposed to link the British capital to the ports and fishing towns of East Anglia. The line faces significant engineering challenges to build it across the wet, boggy fenlands of East Anglia. If it was built, it would provide the hungry London population with fresh fish and other foods. It would also be able to take richer people on holidays to the seaside towns and clean air of the countryside. This is a popular market, but the application to Parliament to build the railway won't be made unless enough money is raised. So will you take the plunge and risk your money on it? Decide how many shares you're going to invest on the London and East Anglia Railway. Update your tally and see how many of your 10 shares you've got left for the fifth and final company. Pause the video while you make your choice. Company number five, the Birmingham and Gloucester Railway. Bear in mind that any remaining shares that you've saved for this, the last company, will need to be invested in this company, whether you like the sound of it or not. Similarly, if you've already used up your shares, tough luck. If you like the sound of this company, it's too late. The Birmingham and Gloucester Railway was proposed to begin running trains in 1841, linking the industrial town of Birmingham to Gloucester. The railway would carry passengers and goods and was to link up with Brunel's Great Western Railway. The railway's main challenge was the steep climb up the Licky Hill Incline. This two-mile climb couldn't be tunnelled under and would push even the most powerful locomotives of the day to their absolute limit. So, how many shares are you going to invest? Decide, and then explain whether you think you've made a sensible investment or not. Pause the video while you make your choice. You should have spent all 10 of your shares now. In a moment, we're going to have a look at the results. What happened to these railway companies and whether you would have made a profit during the railway mania of the 1840s or whether you would have been like so many others and lost everything. Isn't it lucky that we're not playing with real money? So let's have a look at the results. You will find out if you have invested wisely. You will see the fate of each company and then be told how much profit or loss you have made on that company. At the end, add all of your shares together. You started with 10 shares. How many have you ended up with now? So in other words, would you have been one of the great winners from the railway mania, or would you have been one of the great losers? Firstly, the Great Western Railway. The Great Western Railway was a great success and very fast. This is why Britain adopted a single time zone. A different time at every station made timetables impossibly confusing. It also successfully linked Brunel's steamships, the forerunner of today's railways linked with ports and airports. However, Brunel's seven foot and a quarter inch gauge, though better in many ways, was expensive and was not adopted elsewhere. By the 1870s, it all had to be replaced along the entire route and at great expense. That meant that it was profitable, but only reasonably so. You can award yourself a 50% profit for all the shares that you invested. So, if you invested one share, give yourself a score of 1.5. If you invested three, give yourself a share of 4.5. Or use this conversion chart. How many shares did you get? So, now you've noted down your shares returned, and hopefully you made a profit there. Let's see how we get on with company number two. The York and North Midland Railway. The York and North Midland Railway started out as a great success and George Hudson became incredibly rich. However, Hudson was a fraudster. 
He took people's money and spent it on himself. In the end, he had to sell off the railways he had built and people panicked and sold off their shares. This caused a nationwide financial crisis, which bankrupted thousands of people. Your result is any shares you invested in the York and North Midland Railway have been lost. Goodbye to any money you invested in the York and North Midland Railway. And if you're feeling hard done by, this happened with real people's money at the time. Hopefully you'll have better luck on number three. The London and North Western Railway. The London and North Western Railway was created at great risk as its lines had not been making a profit up to that point. However, by combining the companies, it became cheaper and more efficient to run. Not only that, but it expanded at just the right time. The quickly expanding towns of Birmingham and Manchester provided lots of new passengers and the railway became hugely successful, also transporting lots of goods from the factories in those towns. As a result, you've just made 150% profit. So use this conversion chart in order to work out how much profit you've made on the shares that you invested in the London and North Western Railway. So look at that. If you invested all 10 shares in it, then you get 25 back. You've more than doubled your money. Well done. Now let's have a look at company number four. Let's see if that would have been a wise investment. The London and East Anglia Railway. There were hundreds of companies like this one during the railway mania. Entirely fictional. Sorry, but I've just conned you. People were promised a profitable railway, but that the application for a license to build it couldn't be done without the money being invested first. And that's a complete lie. It's a scam. The railway was never meant to be built, and the company took the money and ran away with it. This is similar to those online scams that people sadly fall foul of these days. And they tended to target poorer people who had less experience of dealing with shares. So, much as I'm sorry to have lied to you, it's actually replicating an awful lot of the bad business dealings that went on at the time. Your result is that you have lost all of your invested shares. Sorry about that. Lastly then, and hopefully you've still got some money left for this one, the Birmingham and Gloucester Railway. Despite its engineering challenges, the Birmingham and Gloucester Railway was a limited success. The Licky Hill Incline was a challenge, but extra engines were added to push trains up it, a system that still operates to this day, although most modern uh, trains can get up it without any trouble. You will hear the engines working harder though. Your result then is a 0% profit. That's not as bad as it sounds, in fact. It means that you get to keep every share that you invested. You've not lost any money, but you've not gained any either. You've broken even. So, add up the number of shares that you've had returned in total compared to your 10. If you had 10 shares at the start and you got 10 shares at the end, then at least you got all your money back. However, if you've ended up with fewer than 10, you would have lost out. If you've made a profit, well done. But as you can appreciate, a lot, a lot of this was luck. And that's why so many people lost out from the railway mania. Let's conclude. List the three main types of new transport developments from the Industrial Revolution. Then explain one advantage of each. Lastly, which development do you think was most important in your view? There's no wrong answer to that, but just explain your choice. And I leave you with this rather nice image of one of the last steam trains to puff across the, the Iron Bridge at Torrington. You might recognise this as the Tarka Trail where you can go cycling today. How times change. And yet, the transport revolution and its effects are still with us to this day. Once you've answered those last questions, that's the end of the video, the end of the lesson. I'll say thank you very much for watching. I hope it's been useful and interesting to you. And if it has, give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. But for now, goodbye.